What you are about to see in this video may seem counterintuitive, however, with the help of some animations and hopefully if you stick to the end, you would have a new appreciation for Fourier transforms, spectral analysis and digital signal processing in general. It is well known that a prism can be used to break white light, like sunlight, into more fundamental light components. Such an experiment was first carried out by Isaac Newton where he placed a prism at a beam of sunlight and observed that the resulting light came to be the seven distinct colors of the rainbow. Newton then placed another prism but flipped out upside down, observing how the seven colors merged back again and the full white light was constructed back at the end of the flipped prism. He made the conclusion that a light passing through the first prism was decomposed into its fundamental components and that the seven rainbow colors are the building blocks of all visible lights. The purpose of this video is to study a similar analogy of decomposition. Much like sunlight, signals and waveform can be decomposed as well to a primal building block. And in this video I hope to present the revolutionary theorem of Fourier transforms. And together we will sneak a peek into the Fourier prism, so to speak, and the low level of his invented decomposing decomposing machinery. Fourier argued that any time function can be broken down to a sum of sinusoids, and those sinusoids are the formal building block he utilized to analyze any time domain signal. Let's consider such a building block, the very famous sine function, which is characterized mathematically by three main parameters. The amplitude, represented by the letter A, which tells us the strength of the signal, or its presence. The frequency, represented by Greek letter omega, is a measure of uniform repetition in a time unit. And finally the phase, which is a measure of time delay or time shift. It tells us when did the signal appear in the global timeline. And like any function expression, these parameters act as identifiers distinguishing between sinusoids. More practically, they are information containers in the sense that each parameter can hold a signature featuring the nature of the source that generated the signal in the first place. Take a closer look at this periodic waveform. Now, just by looking, you cannot tell its mathematical model. Like what exactly is the frequency of this waveform? We can only go so far analyzing complex patterns relying only on time domain information and why we need to decompose it into its fundamental sinusoids because we know everything there is to know about sinusoids. Now that we know what to expect from Fourier transforms, let's examine how the output information is presented to us. Uh, taking this periodic waveform as a candidate, we know that Fourier stopped by breaking the original signal into a sum of sinusoids depending on the frequency. I used four sinusoids to create this waveform, so I should expect four frequencies present. The way to present such information in a more compact way is to use a new graph with frequency as independent variable rather than time. Then, the first sinusoid will land on 1 at the frequency axis, an amplitude of 3, telling us that the first component has a frequency of 1 unit and an amplitude of 3. The second one land at a frequency of 7, an amplitude of 1 unit, and so on for the rest of the component. Of course, we are still missing the phase parameter, but we can pack it in a separate graph as well. Thus, putting the frequency as the baseline, we now know the magnitude and the phase relationship to the frequency of all sinusoidal components. This is sort of the big picture that I wanted to get to. The Fourier machine taking time signal as input and produces the frequency function which contains both amplitude and phase information. And part of what makes Fourier transform such an elegant theory is the mathematical simplicity involved. We only need two steps to extract the Fourier transformation from a given time domain signal f of t. First, take your time domain signal f of t, multiply it by a complex exponential of the form e to the minus j omega t, 
Second, integrate this whole product from minus infinity to infinity. And that's it. Whatever comes out of this integral is the spectral information, namely the relationship we graphed before, housing the frequency, phase and amplitude information of the sinusoidal component in the original signal. Perhaps the only strange expression here is the complex exponential. But from other formula, a complex exponential can be expanded to a real and an imaginary part. Complex exponential puts a cosine function on a real axis and a sine function in an imaginary axis as evident by the imaginary constant i. And to visualize that, I will put a cosine function on a horizontal axis and a sine function on a vertical axis to simulate the real and imaginary axis. Their combined motion would be a circle or a rotating vector projected on the third axis. And that's the idea, complex exponentials are simply a rotating vector that creates a circle. In essence, the first step in getting the Fourier transform of a function f of t is to multiply that function by a circle. How do we do that? Let's choose f of t to be a sine function, and we are trying to compute its Fourier transforms. I configure this function to be in discrete form, so that we can see what happens to every sample individually when multiplied by a circle. So here's our f of t, and here's our complex exponential. Each time instance, the sample height of f of t simply scales the rotating vector of the circle. Then we proceed to the next sample. The vector moves to a new angle and the associated sample scales that vector again. And same goes for the next sample. Vector moves to a new angle and then scaled by the sine sample. The red spike represents negative valued samples. Those will scale the rotation vector to a negative value. As you can see, the rotation vector shrinks to its opposite direction. A spin frequency of 10 units means that the rotating vector will complete 10 rounds around the circle over the sample duration. And if those vectors were physical forces trying to pull some mass at the center, the mass will not move because the net acting forces will be zero due to the how the vectors are distributed and oriented. I'm sure now that a lot of you are tempted to see what could happen when I make the spin frequency equal the function frequency of 2 Hz. So let's observe just that. The vectors are now oriented in a way that could physically move a mass away from the center. That's the only two scenarios when all the samples complete its scaling destiny. The resultant vector shape take one of two forms, either dense and centered on the center of the circle or shifted away from the origin. When the spin frequency and the signal frequency are a match, the vectors move their center of mass away from the origin. Otherwise, when the two frequencies are different, the center of mass remain at the origin of the circle. And looking at this analogy backwards, to find the signal frequency, we just track and observe the center of the vector shape whether it shifted or not. Once shifted, then the spin frequency we just plugged in matches a frequency that's in the original signal. Here is a time domain function. Let's assume that we wish to compute its Fourier transforms. Well, the first step, like we just saw, is to multiply this function by a circle, which implies that the whole world where this function lives must be rotated in a circular motion. We get to control how fast the world rotates with the spin frequency omega, the argument of the exponential function. More spin means faster rotation. That's all what the complex exponential is here to do, to spin the world at a frequency of our choosing. 
Keep in mind that we have full access and full control of the spin frequency omega at all time. Now we can change it however we wish. I'll put back the function to analyze back at let's observe the spinning effect over the time function we are analyzing. Observe how the graph is always evenly distributed and symmetric around the time axis. In other words, the center of the graph is always aligned with the center of our function at zero. Now observe carefully what will happen when the spin frequency matches the signal frequency. Notice how the whole graph is shifted away from the time axis and no longer symmetric around the time axis as opposed to when the two frequencies did not match. We don't know the signal frequency, however we have full control over the spin frequency. And that's the idea, that's our separation mechanism, that's how we find the frequency of a signal. Spin that signal at different spinning frequencies, observing the center of the graph, which will always be zero unless the spin frequency matches the signal frequency, at which case the graph center moves away from the time axis. Let's go back to the 2D situation. We just saw when multiplying the time function f of t by the complex exponential, we get a real part and an imaginary part. And we just saw their manifestation in the three-dimensional world. Let's choose a cosine function this time at a frequency of five cycle per time unit. And let's do exactly what we did in the 3D case. Observe the graph of the real and imaginary part, however, separately this time. Again, very straightforward. As long as the spin frequency omega and the function frequency are different, the graph will always be at a center of zero. The instance we create a match, the whole graph shifts away from the time axis. And so a valid question here is, how do we quantify mathematically this behavior of the center of the graph being moved at different cases? Well, simply, we can average the whole graph using integration. And that is the final piece of our puzzle. We integrate the whole graph at each spin frequency. And when the, when the graph is symmetric around the time axis, the integration will return a zero since the positive value cancels the negative ones. However, at a frequency match, the integration, aka the curve average, aka the mean value, aka the center of the graph will be a non-zero value. I think we now have an idea of what the Fourier graph should look like. Few spikes at each frequency that is present in our signal. Now consider the following signal, which is a composite of two sinusoid. I should expect a spike at a frequency of two and another one at a frequency of six. However, and this is the actual Fourier transform scanning the top signal, we get a graph that looks like this, which is far from a perfect spike. It does though tell us the information we need. It's a graph that maxes its value at the frequencies of our signal, each with its relative amplitude. But why aren't we getting the spikes as we anticipated? The reason is related to the infinite limits of the integration. When I talked about sinusoid, I may have purposely misdefined the waveform as I led you to believe that this is a sine wave everywhere. But in reality, it's only a sine wave within a finite limit between 0 and 5. If this waveform was recorded from a sensor, for instance, its value before the recording starts or after the recording ends remain undefined. The Fourier theory requests that we carry out the integration from minus infinity to infinity. How can we perform such an infinite integration when the function we're integrating is only defined in a finite period? You might be tempted to discreetly and quietly change the infinite limits to 0 and 5. That would surely fix the mathematical anomaly and the integration will yield certain value, however. 
it doesn't feel like a Fourier transforms anymore because we cannot expect to change a fundamental idea about a theory and still call it that same theory. But, but since the Fourier theory assumed that the signal extend from minus infinity to infinity and that's the condition to carry out the Fourier transforms, we are just going to have to artificially stitch the missing pieces of the signal up to infinity. Introducing a new signal, W of t, with the on-screen definition. Say if we now multiply the original signal, f of t, with the new W of t. The function f of t will continue to be sine wave between 0 to 5. However, no matter what those undefined values used to be, when multiplied by the zeros coming from W of t, they become zeros as well. So I basically redefine f of t in terms of w of t, which we now call it a window function. And now the whole function is fully defined from minus infinity to infinity. So we have traded the infinite limits of the integration by agreeing to pass this window function w of t alongside f of t, thus making sure that everything and every value of our function outside the undefined range is zero. And there is a price to pay here, meaning that we don't just get the pure Fourier transforms of our signal, but rather we get the Fourier transform of our signal contaminated with the Fourier transforms of the window function WFG. And now each one of those two signals has its own Fourier transforms. The Fourier transform of a rectangular function is a sinc function, which is a sine wave that decays to zero on both ends. And the Fourier transform of our main and windowed function is the ideal spike we saw in part one, that jump at each frequency presence in the signal. Now here is the most intriguing part. When we fuse the original signal with the window function as we're preparing to pass it through the transforms, guess what will happen to their respective spectrum? Well, surprisingly, the sync function will land on the peak spike of the original spectrum. This is true from the fundamental theory of convolution that two functions multiplied together in the time domain is equivalent to their respective spectrum convolved together. And just to fully render this idea in your mind, here's another example, a time domain signal with a rectangular window. I use again two sinusoids to create the yellow signal, hence each one will land on the frequency graph as its frequency. This is the ideal Fourier transform, telling us the frequency content in the original signal. The rectangular red window has a sync function as we just saw leading to two sync peak, each landing on the frequency spike. And this is the final Fourier transform graph of the finite time domain signal using the infinite integration proposed by Fourier.